To me, it seems like the Pixies were one of those bands that came together at just the right point in time. They began their journey in the second half of the 80s, and although they didn't experience a booming success to begin with, they did have a big influence on bands that were coming, such as Nirvana, The Smashing Pumpkins, Radiohead, Arcade Fire, Pavement, and so many others. They also garnered respect from rock icons that came before them. Just check out this quote by David Bowie. The first time I heard the Pixies would have been around 1988. I found it just about the most compelling music outside of Sonic Youth in the entire 80s. In some instances, the nature of their success had been compared to the one of the Velvet Underground. They were ahead of the trend, and maybe they even created the trend itself. They were one of those bands that blended together metal, punk, and noise with more classical rock elements in a mix of extreme dynamics and stop-start timing. Let's take a closer look. The Pixies were formed in Boston, Massachusetts. The band started coming together when guitarist Joey Santiago and Charles Thompson, aka Black Francis, met during their time at the University of Massachusetts, Amherst. Some time later, they both started working in a warehouse and made music on the site. This was back in 84, but it wasn't until 1986 that they decided to take their music more seriously. They formed a band, and a couple of weeks later, Francis made an ad seeking a female bass player. He specifically asked for someone who enjoyed Peter, Paul, and Mary. I'm leaving on a jet plane. I don't and Husker Du. At the audition, a woman named Kim Deal arrived. She didn't even have a bass, and she didn't know how to play the bass, but since she enjoyed the music that Francis showed her, she was allowed to join, and the trio eventually started practicing in Deal's basement. As a reference from Kim's husband, they recruited David Lovering on drums and started to play in his parents' garage instead in mid-1986. Now, when it comes to the band name, they came up with that when Santiago was looking through a dictionary and saw the word Pixies. They liked the look of the word and also the definition, mischievous little elves, so when they started to play shows at clubs and in bars in Boston in 86, that's what they used, and it stuck ever since that time. Hi, we're the Pixies. We're a rock band. Early on, they were discovered by producer Gary Smith, who was the manager of Fort Apache Studios. After seeing the band, he was convinced that they were the next big thing, and he even told the members that he couldn't sleep until they were world famous. In collaboration with Smith, they made a 17-track demo, which has been known as the Purple Tape. The tape found its way into the hands of Ivo watts Russell of the independent record label 4AD. watts Russell didn't find the Pixies impressive to begin with, but his girlfriend persuaded him into signing them anyways. With a record contract and partnership with 4AD, they used 8 of the tracks from the Purple Tape demo for their first mini-LP, Come On Pilgrim. Francis, drawing lyrical inspiration from Puerto Rican culture, religion, sex, and incest, sought to make this album a very versatile effort, at least from a lyrical standpoint. In late 1987, the band started recording their first full-length album, Surfer Rosa. With the help of Steve Albini on production, the album was recorded in four weeks' time and was released during March of 88. The album displays a variety of influences just like their previous material. You have poppier tracks like Brick is Red, alongside the slower and more melancholic songs. One example is Where's My Mind. This type of music really hit home with a European audience. British music magazines hailed the album as the best release of 88, and they were also welcomed with open arms in many other European countries as well. Francis recalls that they were particularly loved in Holland at the time, 
as they got the opportunity to play their first headline shows over there. But the ball wasn't just moving for the band in terms of touring and getting good publicity. More people in the record label industry started paying attention to them back in the US, and this led them to sign with Elektra Records and their creative relationship with British producer Gil Norton. During the last week of 88, the band started recording their second full-length album, Do Little. With this album, their sound became a lot more accessible and smooth, while still keeping their noisy, discordant side present. This might explain why it's considered by many to be their best album ever. Here Comes Your Man is arguably one of their poppiest songs of all time. Following a very simple chord structure, often used in pop music, the band had mixed feelings about putting it on the record which might explain their not-so-enthusiastic gestures during the recording of the music video for the song. Other outstanding moments on the record come from songs like Hey, The Baser, Monkey Gone to Heaven, and Wave of Mutilation. These songs are again discussing a wide range of subjects, everything from surrealism, environmental catastrophes and women, to sex, religion, and avant-garde movies. But what made this album and the band sound so special was the fact that they were so different from everything considered popular at the time. This was the time when hair metal bands were dominating the airtime on radio stations and college rock had found its own little niche as well. Pixies, on the other hand, was in the middle of all of that. They were noisy, punky and poppy all at the same time. Now, after the release of Doolittle, tensions started building in the band, especially between Deal and Francis. Kim Deal had been described as a headstrong woman who wanted a bigger influence on the band's sound and direction. Francis obviously didn't like this, so during one of the concerts in Stuttgart, Germany, he actually threw his guitar at her. You know what I'm saying? You put four people in the same room for five years and there's gonna be tension eventually. Once someone has like started to annoy you, then you're all, you're, you can smell them coming around the corner. You know what I mean? Here they come. What? Oh God, there they go. We don't talk to each other that much. And it's not because we don't like each other. It's just the kind of people that we are. Later on, Deal was almost fired from the band when she refused to play. I think that I did the first single and we were like kind of, you know, new to it and and I think that after I sang the first single and he kind of thought, well, hey, this is just supposed to be a little gimmick here. She's not supposed to be a real singer, you know what I mean? So I think he kind of didn't like all the attention diverting. Now after their last show in New York in support of this album, the band members went separate paths. Santiago and Lovering went on vacation. Francis went on to do a solo tour, while Deal formed a new band called The Breeders. After a short hiatus, the guys in the band moved to Los Angeles to record their third album. They had very little time to practice beforehand, so much of the material for the record was written by Francis in the studio. Sometimes he had to come up with the lyrics only a few minutes before recording them, writing them down on napkins. In the beginning, they used Cherokee Studios as their recording space, but they very quickly stumbled into problems along the way. Gil Norton had to put the recordings on pause after 6 p.m. every single day because the recording desk would somehow pick up on signals from pirate radio stations. At another occasion, they found out that every time they plugged something into a guitar amplifier, it would generate this incredible hum. Luckily enough, the problem got solved once they got in contact with Rick Rubin, who helped them arrange recordings in another studio. The result of all the intense hard work was Bossa Nova, their third full-length album, which was released in August of 1990. The album's lyrics focus on themes of aliens and outer space, which really fitted perfectly together with the surf rock and space rock mix in their sound. Again, the band kept up their heavy schedule of touring and made yet another record that was released in 91. This was an album that saw the band returning to their roots with an abrasive and more harsh sound.
This would be the last album to feature Kim Deal on bass, since the tension between her and Francis only continued to grow as time went on. After supporting U2 on their Sue TV tour in 92, the band broke up, and the members once again went down separate paths. Francis announced in an interview with BBC5 that the band was finished, but didn't give any specific explanation of why it went that way. Francis renamed himself as Frank Black and went on to create a string of solo records. Kim Deal rejoined her band, The Readers, and had a lot of success with the release of their second album, Last Splash, that went on to sell over a million records. Santiago supported Frank Black during his album recordings and live performances. He also started making music for TV shows and even made his own band with his wife called The Martinis. Lovering, on the other hand, became a performing magician, but he still kept supporting different bands with his drum skills from time to time as well. This is what seemed to be the last that we would ever hear from the Pixies, but in 2003 they started a reunion tour. It wasn't without his flaws though. Lovering had issues with drugs after the loss of his father to cancer. I thought I was watching someone having a breakdown, a meltdown. I couldn't understand why he kept playing. Both Francis and Santiago had a lot more responsibility on their hands since they both had become fathers, and Deal, who had been sober for over a year after having troubles with alcohol, still struggled to talk openly with the band members and chose to travel with their sister during the entire tour in a separate van. I've never seen four people not be able to talk to each other. You guys are the worst four communicators ever! <laughs> ever! <laughs> I'm a little worried about you. What are you going to do mentally? I don't care, I just don't want you to go. But the band went on to make another two full-length albums, obviously without the help of Kim. Indie Cindy in 2014 and Head Carrier in 2016. They also decided to put out these records independently, but we'll talk more about that in another video. For now, I think it's fair to say that Pixies inspired a lot of bands that came after them, and if you want to listen to some of their best stuff, then make sure you check out Surferosa and uh, Doolittle. Of course, their hardcore fans would say that all of their albums are amazing, but those are the most crucial as I've seen so far. That's it guys, thank you so much for watching this video. I just want to give a huge shout out to Frank from Middle 8. He actually helped me with the narration of this video. Uh, so check out his channel by clicking the icon on the screen. Also let me know in the comments what artists or bands you want me to feature in my next videos. Alright, cheers, bye.